So the different faces of Grey Friars and what should we make of them? Um, so we're not talking about the human faces that are cast in various roles around the churchyard. You know, the resurrection spirits, the, the death heads, the angels um, and the, the personal images. We're not talking about those. We're talking about these. We're focusing on the faces with unusual features. Um, now, and fundamentally, we're asking, are they related to these? So these are your classic foliate faces, foliate heads that are quite common in medieval churches, either on the outside of the building or inside the, the medieval churches. Um, they're particularly enigmatic, particularly evocative image um, that was prevalent in the medieval period between about the 11th and 15th centuries. Um, so we're just asking whether there could be some sort of relationship between the two. Fundamentally, we're asking whether him, this chap at Grey Friars, is related, oh, sorry, with, with and they are coloured in his foliage so you can get a, a sense of what, uh, what the characteristics of that uh, face are that we're interested in, and whether he is related to that face, which is a, a famous one of the many foliate faces. There's over 100 foliate faces at Roslyn Chapel just down the road, dating back to the 14th and 15th centuries. But as we all know, foliage demonstrates the cycle of birth, growth, death, decay, and new life. As the seasons move from one to the other, foliage, whether it be trees or plants or anything else, cycles from life to death and back to life again. And that is a theme that was picked up or crops up across many centuries, many cultures, many religions in many, many places. It's uh, certainly not unique to anyone. But we get a clue as to how it is interpreted by the people who designed 17th and 18th century gravestones by some of the inscriptions on the stone. And this is one I came across just the other day, um, actually over in Ayrshire. And th this is on a stone for seven children um, that had died. Um, and the inscription reads, here waiting for the joyful day, the flowers soon cropped shall be made fresh again. The leaves of spring, once so fresh and gay, are fallen, but the root doth stay. So, so the, the imagery, and obviously the words are very, very evocative around um, foliage, flowers being cropped and then becoming fresh again. Now, all around the churchyard, we have numerous examples of foliage, fruit and flowers. Um, that, that's a recurring image um, on many panels, many faces, many facets of, of the graveyard. But those ones aren't associated with faces. They're just um, foliage in their own right. It's where the foliage is actually associated with a face. And it's not just at Grey Friars we see this. Everywhere we look around Scotland, we, we can see faces decorating buildings in this case, where you have there a face which is effectively disgorging forget-me-nots. And that's from a, a building in Dundee. It's now in the Dundee Hough uh, burial ground, but it was originally on a building locally. And even right up into the 19th century, this is a, a panel on the library just around the corner from Greyfriars on George IV Bridge. Um, and there clearly are two um, humanoid figures made out of foliage. And that's a 19th century panel. But also going back to the medieval, we should remind ourselves that there are many mythical creatures and monsters that decorate um, medieval churches. And many of them have protruding features of horns or ears or manes. Is any of that foliage? Or, or, or are they meant to be other things? And, and one of the recurring images we see on medieval churches is faces with feline features. Uh, more lion-esque, the better, obviously, as, as the three images um, from a 12th century gravestone, uh, not gravestone, 12th century church um, door demonstrate. And, and one thing I should point out that, you know, every symbol, every detail on the memorials at Greyfriars and elsewhere, they're carefully chosen to convey meaning, and often that meaning is multiple meanings within each of those symbols or images. And taking the image of a lion, that lion can symbolize a role such as a protector role or a virtue such as courage, or it can be associated with resurrection. We should remember that our um, medieval and 15th, 16th century um, ancestors, they didn't have the benefit of Edinburgh Zoo. They didn't have um, the natural world on their TV at night. And there was a belief that lion cubs were born dead, but would come to life after three days when they were breathed upon by a male lion. 
And just bear in mind that three days is the number of days Jesus lay in the tomb before being resurrected. So those sorts of associations were quite common in those days, but are forgotten to us today. So let's step into Grey Friars and let's look for faces with unusual features. Let's look particularly for faces that have hints of foliage or fantastical beasts with lioness features. But in doing so, remember we have to adopt a 17th century mindset, a mindset in which the attitudes to death, to life, um, to hopes and fears, to faith, are actually very different from our own. So step through the doors, um, and let's just firstly just turn to the left as we come through the doors. And the very first memorial that we would see if we turned left as we came through the door is the John Milne Memorial. John died in 1667. He was the master mason to the crown, uh, and he worked on some of Edinburgh's finest memorials and finest buildings. But this memorial to John was done by his nephew, Robert Milne, um, who um, was John's apprentice and successor as master mason. Now, if you look more closely at that memorial, we see four faces that are of interest to us today. Um, these are the four. If we just home in on those, this one at the top here, clearly it's a face, there's an eyes, there's a nose, a mouth, but there is also modest foliage. But the distinctive feature here is the very large bat-like wings. What I would pick out is the foliage. I've just circled in green there or outlined in green there. Often it's quite subtle. And if we go further down on that monument, we see this face, clearly a lion-esque face, but there are scrolls. Are those scrolling a hint of foliage? And then its association with the winged spirit is something we commonly come across. One of these faces with unusual features are often paired up uh, or contextually close to the resurrection spirit. If we go further down on the Mill Monument, we see these pair of very distinctive faces, Clearly, again, faces, eyes, nose, mouth, but plenty of scrolls, plenty of sweeping, which could be indicative of foliage. Uh, and then this little chap that's often overlooked on this tomb, sadly, he's slightly eroded now, but there's little little face poking up um, from that uh, sort of shelf there uh, and staring out again with the sort of scrolly um, features protruding from his forehead and the sides of his head. If we go across the other side of the graveyard, another, um, Mill Monument, this one to Chambers or Chalmers in 1675, very similar layout. If we drive, drove into there, again, we have that lion-esque face with, with foliage, clearly leaves growing out the bridge of his nose. Um, and I draw them on there so you can see what I'm talking about. And again, look at the close association with the resurrection spirit. Um, and this monument, the Spens Monument, same year, 1675, again by Robert Milne, and again, a similar format. A slightly lower budget memorial, slightly smaller in scale, but we have the same distinct faces appearing top, middle and bottom. And this is the middle one, not quite so lioness, but clearly beastly with slight hints of foliage. But, but they are very subtle if they are foliage at all here. Those sort of lines um, slightly wavy lines coming out of the bridge of the nose again. And then if we look at this one, I think this is probably a, a, a Robert Milne. Don't know for sure, but this is actually on the wall of the Kirk itself, uh, the North Wall. Um, and again, very similar format. We've got um, top, middle and bottom. We have that, that face, which is less lion-esque, more bat-like, certainly beastie. But are, is that foliage protruding from its nose uh, either side? Um, and again, the association with the resurrection spirit. And at the bottom, this tiny little sort of quite enigmatic little creature here with, again, clearly a face. But again, is that foliage more, you know, top, middle and bottom there um, on that little, little peculiar face? And then probably one of my favourite monuments in the, in the um, Kirkyard is the Bannatyne Memorial. And that's 30 or 40 years earlier than the ones we've just looked at. But if we look more closely on here, we'll see where the foliage or the blue circles at the bottom, but the, the, the heads with unusual features are the ones I've circled there. And this one in particular. This one in the top right of this picture is the one I think is the closest we get to a classical foliate face at Greyfriars. That chap there, again, closely associated with the resurrection spirit, has clearly got foliage um, coming out of his nose and out of the bridge of his nose. Um, and also interesting on that particular memorial, as many others, every spare space is covered with foliage. Um, if we look at his little bit closer at him and then we look at his 
pair, his, his counterpart that's looking across at him from the other side, and we look in that top right hand corner, there's just an example of bits of foliage filling in all the spaces. And then look at that chap looking at the cherub. Again, slightly unusual face, but clearly there is some sort of leaf like um, protrusion coming out of his nose. Uh, and that one's his pair there. And then this chap, oh, this is on Elizabeth Patton's memorial in the top right hand corner, often overlooked. But it's like a strange sort of gorilla-like feature. But if you look at his forehead and look above his head, he's wearing a leafy hat. Um, very, very strange creature. And then this one, again, much more suggestive, this scrolling. is taking scrolling to the max, as I put it here. Is that indicative or, or trying to suggest um, swirls of foliage? And then you get these cheeky chaps that crop up around various parts of the memorials. Another little one hiding in plain sight. On, on the perimeter of a monument, and then some stranger creatures like this chap here and this chap here. So just to sum up, we've got fantastical multifaceted creatures all around Greyfriars. The foliage is often subtle, more suggestive rather than explicit. And that contrasts with the other mortality and res resurrection symbolism of this period, which are very explicit, indeed brutally explicit, like the heads, the skeletons, the skulls, etc. So question is, why, why are the foliate features not equally explicit? Um, but like so much else in, in the Kirkyard and Kirkyards generally, they're an uncodified series of emblems that could have all sorts of origins, all sorts of roots. Um, but they are Christian. Let's not fall into the pagan or the Masonic or the plague or the pirate trap. The, these figures are as Christian as any of the others. They're certainly as Christian as the deadheads. Um, um, it would be lovely to say people were hedging their bets. It was my little favourite trite expression that I used to use when I was explaining foliate faces, that they were some sort of pagan memory, but they're not. They, they clearly are Christian. Um, that's why they appear in all sorts of Christian churches and Christian contexts. They're probably not connected to the Jack and the Greens, the Robin of the Woods or the Robin Hoods of this world. But again, it just shows how, um, how repetitive the motif of green association is. Um, the context, as I've pointed out several times, suggests they are associated with mortality and resurrection. But what is particularly interesting is that they're almost uniquely part of Scottish 17th and 18th century greystone art. Um, several centuries after foliate faces appeared very widely across um, Great Britain um, and churches of the day, their, their appearance in the 17th and 18th century on greystones is almost unique to Scotland. Not quite, but almost. Um, so we should probably see them in the context of the Reformed Church of Scotland. Now, I, I'd like to think that perhaps there's a sense of creative freedom associated with greystones and memorials that wasn't um, available to many artists or many individuals elsewhere because of some of the teachings of the church. And I'd also like to just hint that there might be a sense of humour present in them. But nevertheless, I think they're very intriguing, compelling, can be controversial, but they're certainly charming. Thank you.